Hello everyone and welcome back, hope you're having a great day and we're all doing well. So if you have been watching some of my videos recently, you may be aware some of them I didn't really have any voiceover in. That is actually because I've been on vacation for the past two weeks and as of recording right now, I am just off an international flight. So if I do sound a bit tired, I apologize. However, the brand new season of Rainbow Six Siege has just released and alongside it, so is the battle pass. But the grind doesn't stop and we are trying to hit 100k by the end of the year. So if you are new and you're going to enjoy, hit that sub button, it's free and let's hit that goal. Now, if you keep up with the lore or Rainbow Six Siege, by this point, you know that there is lore inside of these battle passes. However, if you don't keep up with it, basically, there is lore inside of battle passes, and a lot of the time, it gives us an in-depth look at the operators and how they're feeling, as well as setting up the story going forward. Now, these pieces of lore will be little descriptions alongside some of the cosmetics in the battle passes. They don't necessarily have to coincide with the cosmetic itself. As you'll see in this video, there'll be some cosmetics that wouldn't exist in-universe and wouldn't be used in the story itself. However, the lore description that comes with them is important for the story. However, before we jump into them and break them down, we first have to start with the story tab. This will directly carry on from the cinematic we've seen at the beginning of the season, where Deimos attacks Tower. And this little paragraph is from the perspective of Ram, the brand new operator. And if you want to learn more about Ram, I have an entirely separate video covering her backstory. So let's start by reading this paragraph titled Immovable Object. And it says the following. Logically, I know it wasn't my fault, but this feeling remains. My friend is gone forever and I can sketch, I can listen to music, I can train, but she's still not coming back. Deimos deserves a fate worse than the ones his victims at Tower met with. You attack us like that? You sign your own death warrant. I don't care how strong an enemy appears, we do not stop. When you're a red hammer, there is no such thing as an immovable object. We're coming. So that was Ram's perspective on the entire attack which happened on Tower, and now we're going to move into the descriptions of some of the items in the Battle Pass. And we're going to start with this one by IQ. Now the reason why I think this one by IQ is extremely interesting is because IQ isn't part of Rainbow. She left to work for Nighthaven, and we haven't really heard anything from her since she left. And what she says is, Vigil, I know you won't read this, but what happened wasn't your fault. I'm here if you need me. So that shows that IQ still cares about her former colleagues. And she maybe feels that Vigil might feel a bit guilty since he was the one, you know, training these operators when the attack happened. And I find this very interesting because if I'm not wrong, this is the first time any ex-Rainbow operative that went to join Nighthaven has actually made contact to a Rainbow operator. I know Callie last battle pass was saying that she hoped Ash recovers, but I'm talking the operators which were core Rainbow Ops then left to join Nighthaven. And what we could take from this as well is it seems like IQ has has maybe went and talked to Kali to maybe sort of intervene with the whole demo situation. And this is supported by the next description, which is a little quote from Kali. And she says, trust me, Weiss, we will act when the risk doesn't outweigh the gain. So the way I interpret that is either two ways. That first one from IQ was a message she maybe went to send to Rainbow and Kali maybe seen that message. And this is where the response is coming from. Or after sending that message, IQ went and talked to Kali, who is the leader of Nighthaven and is basically like, look, maybe we should step in here. And that is when Callie gives a reply saying that, yeah, we'll step in when the risk doesn't outweigh the gain. We'll step in when we're gaining something from this and we're not putting our lives at risk. I don't know, to me, it kind of sounds like IQ is wishing that they would step in a little bit. And it seems like IQ isn't the only ex-Rainbow operator who joined Nighthaven to have this feeling. This one for Smoke is actually talking to Ella, and he says, Your sister's recovered, Ella. Why are you still so tense? Now, you may have seen my other videos where I think that Sophia and Ella are the key for Rainbow and Nighthaven to work together again. I think they represent both sides perfectly, and I think that relationship is going to come back stronger. But what we get from this is that one, Sophia did recover, two, Ella did know that Sophia was attacked, and three, it upset Ella. I, I assumed that this would happen. I assumed that the reason why, you know, Ubisoft wrote in the fact that Sophia would be in that mission was to, you know, sort of swayed Ella a bit, because I definitely think out of any operator on Nighthaven that would, you know, leave Nighthaven again, or maybe be that bridge to working together, would be Ella. She already has that rebellious nature in her, and I think especially since her and Sophia got an entire cinematic dedicated to them, means that that story isn't over. But I don't know why Smoke's acting a bit stupid. It's like, yeah, Sophia recovered, but, you know, she almost got killed. It's like, that's still her sister, and yes, 
Sophia got recovered, but Ash is in a coma. That could have been Sophia. Sophia could have had a worse state. I don't know. I feel like sometimes they make Smoke sound like a bit of an idiot. You know, of course, Ella's still going to be quite tense. That is only the first attack in Sophia. He could go for Sophia once again. Her sister's life is still at risk. The guy which, you know, almost killed her is still at large and seemingly getting stronger. I don't know. I think the way that Thatcher now perceives Smoke as pretty much as a backstabbing isn't that far off. I mean, like the way he's talking to Ella here seems very shallow minded. Maybe that's not what they were going for with this. Maybe this was just to teach us that Zofia did recover and Ella was feeling pretty upset about the whole situation of her being injured. But to me, that's how I perceive smoke in these situations. When he's saying stuff like this, it does seem to be a bit, you know, shallow minded. This next one is just a very simple one by Thorne talking about Ram. And all she says is absolute unit because Ram is an absolute unit, both in the lore and in game. This next one is by Ram herself, and she says, a good soldier masters her feelings. Vengeance is patient. And I feel like a really cool dynamic with this quote by Ram is when you look at the situation with Azami. Since it is said that she is trying to jump the gun a little bit and really wants to take Deimos out. So it's interesting seeing Azami and Ram who both want vengeance, but it seems Ram is a bit more calm and collected. I mean, maybe not in the cinematic, but definitely now. Whereas Azami, it seems like maybe she's getting a bit more on edge and really wants to take him out. This next one is by Kaid, another Red Hammer operator. Of course, uh, Ram is in Red Hammer and he says tarantulas are perfect predators adding one to red hammer is a stroke of genius now the reason why he says that is because tarantula is the name of her battalion that is where she's from but i also just really think it's funny that kaid is once again being showcased in this battle pass because he was in the last one as well uh, when Fenrir joined Red Hammer, of course, both Ram and Fenrir are part of the same squad. And in this, Kaid is like, you know, stroke of genius. She's amazing. Bring her on this team. It's absolutely brilliant. But then when it comes to Fenrir, he's like, this guy shouldn't be here. I don't trust this guy. It's quite funny having a season apart where Kaid, you know, really has these differing views on both these operators due to the background they have both came from. You know, Fenrir was an outcast. He was outcast from the scientific and military community. And Ram is this respected soldier, which definitely aligns more with what Kaid is looking for. But Kaid doesn't call the shots in Red Hammer, Captain Thermite does, and we actually have a little bit by Thermite himself. And what he says is, Sledge, Ash, Harry. There's only one way this ends, and for that to happen, the whole team's got to align. Now, of course, he's only talking about Sledge and Ash when it comes to operators because the other operators which are on that mission, Kivera and Zofia, aren't part of his team. He's focusing on Red Hammer in this statement. Of course, Harry is a little bit of an exception since he overlooked everyone. But we do know the states of Sledge and Ash. Sledge did recover. He did have a few broken ribs, if I was not wrong. We did learn that in a previous battle pass. He had some shrapnel in his leg, I believe. And as far as we're aware, Ash is still in a coma. And Harry, I'm sure you all are aware, was eliminated by Deimos. So Thermite talking about the whole team aligning is a big thing, especially with Fenrir being in the mix and a lot of people, you know, kind of liking him and a lot of people kind of not liking him and not trusting him. So he really needs to sort Red Hammer out. Now this one is from Vigil and he is talking about Ram and he says, Ram let her emotions take control at Tower. Positive outcome, yes, but it's not a habit she should indulge in again. And I do agree, especially soldiers of this caliber should be able to control their emotion. However, I'll take Ram's defense here. There was a helicopter attacking the building it killed her friends and i think her response was pretty reasonable however it is a bad habit to get into as we've seen many times acting on your emotions can lead to failure next up we have a little bit by amaru and she says loss can be disorientating but can also provide clarity and purpose i wish ram the latter and here we just have another red hammer operative showing her condolences for ram and the event which happened at the tower and it is just interesting to hear from amaru also the talk of loss can be traced to her backstory she did have hope that her great-grandfather would return one day despite going missing years ago and as well as this she did grow really close with Goyo who lost his family in an explosion. All of this stuff shaping them to the people they will become and in her words providing them clarity and purpose. Next up we have Melissa and what she says is the feeling you have like something's been ripped from you hold on to that let it be the reason you never give up. A big part of Melissa's story is that she's anti-poaching. She saves animals from these very dangerous poachers who, just like she says, will rip, you know, these baby animals away from their families just to harvest their tusks and stuff like that, especially endangered ones. And the fact that she was once ambushed, which basically destroyed her unit, you know, she's had a lot of stuff ripped from her in her past and she understands how it feels on other creatures as well. So she can definitely sympathize in that sense. Next up, we have a little bit from Castle and he says, for someone who breaks down to 
defenses, Ram sure is guarded. Not a very deep one, but a pretty good observation. I like a lot of time when they compare the operator's gadget to their personality. Now, the next one we have is by Fenrir. Really interesting hearing about him since he is only a season old at this point, but he is, of course, another Red Hammer operator alongside uh, Ram. So it does make sense that we could hear a little bit from him. And what he says is, Choi's actions at the tower may have seemed reckless, but my training tells me she was in total control. And by his training, I assume his Red Hammer training, which is why maybe him and Vigil have different opinions on this, since Vigil is part of Ghost Eyes and Fenrir is part of Red Hammer. So maybe Fenrir knows a little bit more of the Red Hammer way than Vigil does. This next one is just a little bit by Ram reflecting on her past. And she says, in the orphanage, I fought alone. In Rainbow, we fight as one. Just a really nice little reflection. Next up, we have one by Frost. And she says, when you're hunting big game, you don't just fire wildly, you lay a trap. And of course, I believe she is talking about Deimos and that is how she would like to take him out. Rather than trying to hunt him down with little bits of information, you lead Deimos to them. Just like how he went after the tower, they could, you know, provide him some false information, he goes to attack it, and Rainbow get the upper hand. We know how important traps are in this game, and that mindset may work. Next up, we have a little bit by Dokubi, and she says, No one should have known the training location. We have a vulnerability, a back door that needs closing. So if what Dokubi is saying is true, that means the guy that Fenrir was talking to in the comic should not have known that the tower existed. Could someone inside of Yahata Data Security know about Deimos and be working for Deimos? I mean, that could maybe explain how they knew that Yahata was going through that market that one day. It seems like there is a bigger conspiracy here. I guess that just depends on how you interpret this one but you know there could be more of a story here this one's a little bit funny and it's just mozzie talking about this charm and he says well i'll be a tiger on a frag grenade it's also kind of funny that mozzie's saying this since his gadget is like a little spider jumping on drones this is a tiger jumping on a grenade it's a, a cool little dynamic i'm not sure if they intended that but if they did that's you know kind of funny this next one by Nomad is something that I was wondering, and I'm glad that she's kind of confirmed it. And she says, multiple dead. Downtown Seoul is looking like a war zone. This is getting out of hand. And I was kind of wondering what was happening with this tower because they did update it in game to reflect what happened in the animation. However, if you look down at the floor, people are still just driving around this tower like normal. I kind of wish that maybe they changed what it looked like in the distance so people don't get close to the tower. Maybe it's, you know, blocked off by police. And I feel like there's going to be a big response to this. I mean, Deimos before has been kind of attacking Rainbow in the background. The general public wasn't really aware that, you know, Rainbow was getting attacked. They, I, I guess they knew that Rainbow existed because of the stadium. You know, I don't agree with the stadium itself, but, you know, that's happened. They've used that as a story leverage. So people do know that Rainbow exists. However, they didn't know that Deimos was attacking them. Well, they may not know that Deimos is attacking Rainbow, but they definitely know that someone has just attacked the tower in Seoul. You know, uh, a big city. I can't imagine that news aren't gonna you know, report this one this is probably gonna be like a worldwide event so the stakes have definitely gotten higher because deimos is not only out of the shadows for rainbow He's seemingly out of the shadows of the world. This next one is by Gridlock talking about the boogie, which is the gadget of Ram. As she did the device evaluation of that, you'll see that in the full Ram lore video. But what she says is, field testing the boogie has been the most expensive one we've ever run, but worth every penny. And this is very fitting for her since we do know that she does enjoy going to these, you know, robot bot fights in her free time. It's something she's passionate about. So having her, you know, a little bit obsessed with the boogie makes a lot of sense because that thing is like straight out of robot. Robot Wars. This next one's a little funny, and it's by Flores, and it says, I spent ages making this for her, yet Dokubi says it still isn't spicy enough. So it seems like Flores is, you know, cooking up some special food for the Rainbow Operatives. Of course, he's a chef. I guess it would make sense. I just like that little dynamic. It's quite fun that they've played into that part of Flores. That Spanner one is interesting. It includes a lot of his backstory, and he says, when you lose someone undercover, you grieve in secret. It's a kindness we can openly mourn those loss at the tower. That is because, in his story, Bandit did go undercover inside of the gang which operates from the map known as clubhouse i'm thinking of doing a separate lore video for that in the future but bandit is very well known for being a very good undercover operative now we have a few here which sort of plays into the dynamic of vigil and mozzie uh, if you don't know vigil hates mozzie he said it on multiple occasions he absolutely hates that man so this first one is by mozzie and he says this is the first time he's taken a leadership role since the invitational he didn't deserve what happened at tower and by the way as far as i'm aware it doesn't really seem like mozzie dislikes vigil 
it seems to be a very one-sided hate relationship. Morsi seems to always try and cozy up to Vigil and maybe, you know, kind of be nice to him, but Vigil seemingly just doesn't like him. As we see with this next one, this is also a Vigil in-game face reveal, but he says, is this a joke to Morsi? Recruits died and he bakes me a meat pie? So it seems like, you know, Morsi is just trying to comfort Vigil. I really hope we learn more about this dynamic and I really want to learn why Vigil truly hates Morsi so much. And the final one we have here is by Vigil yet again and he says, keep the Swede away from me. I'm not doing another psych eval. Of course, when he says the Swede, he's referring to Fenrir. Fenrir popping his head up once again in the story. I feel like Ubisoft are going to use Fenrir quite a lot and I'm all for it. He's one of my favorite characters already and I can't wait to see more of him. And so as far as I'm aware, if I've not missed any, that is every piece of lore from the brand new battle pass in Operation Heavy Metal. Be sure to let me your thoughts in the comment section below about everything we have learned in this new battle pass. Check out my entire lore video to learn Rainbow Six Siege lore from the start if this is something you haven't seen before. As well as this, check out my other videos. There's definitely something you'll enjoy. Be sure to hit that sub button since we're trying to hit 100k by the end of the year. Let me know your thoughts, drop a like, and I shall catch you later. I love you all. Stay safe. Peace.